Section 6 of the Afghan Wars, 1839 to 1842 and 1878 to 1880, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yalda and Marzad. The Afghan Wars, 1839 to 1842 and 1878 to 1880. Part 2 by Archibald Forbes. Chapter 5 On the Defensive in Sherpur. Although over large for its garrison, the Sherpur cantonment had many of the features of a strong defensive position. On the southern and western faces, the massive and continuous onset made it impregnable against any force unprovided with siege artillery. But on the eastern face, the wall had been built to the elevation only of seven feet and at either end of the Bimaru Heights, which constituted the northern line of defense, there were open gaps which had to be made good. The space between the northwestern bastion and the heights was closed by an entrenchment supported by a lager of Afghan gun carriages and limbers, the ground in front strengthened by abatis and wire entanglements, beyond which a village flanking the northern and western faces was occupied as a detached post. The open space on the northeastern angle was similarly fortified. The village of Bimaru was loopholed and outlying buildings to the front were placed in a state of defense. The unfinished eastern wall was heightened by logs built up in tires, and its front was covered with abatis, a tower and garden outside being occupied by a detachment. A series of block houses had been built along the crest of the Bimaru Heights, supporting a continuous entrenchment, gun emplacements made in the line of defense, and the gorge dividing the heights strongly fortified against an attack from the northern plain. The onset was divided into sections, to each of which was assigned a commanding officer with a specified detail of troops, and a strong reserve of European infantry was under the command of Brigadier General Baker, ready at short notice to reinforce any threatened point. It was presumably owing to the absorption of the troops in fighting, collecting supplies, and providing winter shelter, that when the concentration within Sherpur became suddenly necessary, the defenses of the position were still seriously defective. And throughout the period of investment, the force was unremittingly engaged in the task of strengthening them. Nor had the military precaution been taken of raising the villages and enclosures within the fire zone of the onsen, and they remained to afford cover to the enemy during the period of investment. Before the enemy cut the telegraph wire in the early morning of the 15th, Sir Frederick Roberts had informed the authorities in India of his situation and of his need for reinforcements and he had also ordered up General Charles Gough's brigade without loss of time. Gough was already at Jagdalak when he received the order calling him to Kabul, but he had to wait for reinforcements and supplies, and the tribesmen were threatening his position in the line of communication in rear of it. He did not move forward until the 21st. On the following day, he reached Lataband, whence he took on with him the garrison of that post, but although his march was unmolested, it was not until the 24th that he reached Sherpur, a day too late to participate in repelling the assault on the cantonment. While General Roberts' force was busily engaged in making good the defenses of Sherpur, the Afghans refrained from attempting to back their success on the Asmai Heights by an assault on the defensive position which seemed to invite an attack. During the first two days of their possession of the city, they were enjoying the fruits of their occupation in their own turbulent manner. Robert Spice reported them busily engaged in sacking the Hindu and Guzalbash quarters, 
in looting and wrecking the houses of chiefs and town folks who had shown friendliness to the British, and in squirreling among themselves over the spoils. Requisitioning was in full force. The old Mullah Mushki Alum was the temporary successor of General Hills in the office of Governor of Kabul. In spite of his 90 years, he threw extraordinary energy into the work of arousing fanatism and rallying to Kabul the fighting men of the surrounding country. The jihad of which he had been the chief instigator had certainly attained unexampled dimensions. And although it was not in the nature of things that every Afghan who carried arms should be inspired with religious fanatism to such a pitch as to be utterly reckless of his life, swarms of fierce Ghazis made formidable the levies which Muhammad Jan commanded. On the 17th and 18th, the Afghans made ostentatious demonstrations against Sherpur, but those were never formidable although they made themselves troublesome with some perseverance during the daytime, consistently refraining from night attacks, which was remarkable, since ordinarily they are much addicted to the chapau. There never was any investment of Sherpur, or indeed any approximation to investment. Cavalry reconnaissances constantly went out, and Piquet and Videttes were habitually on external duty. Infantry detachments sallied forth whenever occasion demanded to dislodge the assailants from points occupied by them in inconvenient proximity to the defences. The Afghan offensive was not dangerous, but annoying and wearying. It was indeed pushed with some resolution on the 18th, when several thousand men poured out of the city and skirmished forward under cover of the gardens and enclosures on the plain between Kabul and Sherpur, in the direction of the southern front and the southwestern bastions. The Afghans are admirable skirmishers, and from their close cover kept up for hours a brisk fire on the soldiers lining the Sherpur defenses, but with singularly little effect. The return rifle fire was for the most part restricted to follies directed on those of the enemy who offered a sure mark by exposing themselves. And shell fire was chiefly used to drive the Afghan skirmishes from their cover in the gardens and enclosures. Some of those, notwithstanding, were able to get within 400 yards of the onset, but could make no further headway. On the morning of the 19th, it was found that in the night, the enemy had occupied the Mir Akhor fort, a few hundred yards beyond the eastern face, and close to the residency compound of the old cantonments of 1839 to 1842. The fire from this fort was annoying, and General Baker went out on the errand of destroying it with 800 bayonets, two mountain guns, and a party of sappers. As the fort was being approached through the dense mist, a sudden folly from it struck down several men, and Lieutenant Montenero of the mountain battery was mortally wounded. The fort was heavily shelled from the southeastern bastion. Its garrison evacuated it, and it was blown up. Mohammed Jan and his coadjutors could hardly flatter themselves that as yet they had made any impression on the steadfast defense which the British force was maintaining in the Sherpur cantonment. The Afghan leader had tried force in vain. He knew the history of that strange period in the winter of 1841, during which Afghan truculence and audacity had withered the spirit of a British force, not much less numerically strong than the little army now calmly withstanding him. Things had not gone very well with that little army of late. Possibly its constancy might have been impaired and its chief might be willing as had been Elphinstone and the LG to listen to terms. Anyhow, there could be no harm in making a proffer based on the old lines. So the Afghan leader proposed to General Roberts, apparently in all seriousness, that the British army should forthwith evacuate Afghanistan encountering no molestation in its march, that the British general before departing should engage 
that Yaqub Khan should return to Afghanistan as its Amir, and that there should be left behind two officers of distinction as hostages for the faithful fulfillment of the contract. We have a lack of men. They are like wolves, eager to rush on their prey. We cannot much longer control them. Such were said to have been the terms of a message intended to disturb the equanimity of the British commander. Mir Bacha and his Kohistanis, again, were not to all appearance anxious for the restoration of Yakub. They professed themselves content to accept our staunch friend Wali Muhammad as Amir, if only the British army would be good enough to march home promptly and leave to Afghans the administration of Afghan affairs. It was not likely that a man of Robert's nature would demean himself to take any notice of such overtures. For the moment, circumstances had enforced on him the wisdom of accepting the defensive attitude, but he knew himself, nevertheless, the virtual master of the situation. He had but one serious anxiety, the apprehension lest the Afghans should not harden their hearts to deliver an assault on his position. That apprehension was not long to give him concern. On the 20th, as a menace against the southern face of Sherpur, the enemy took strong possession of the Mohammed Sharif fort, stormed so gallantly by Colonel Griffiths on 6th November 1841. And they maintained themselves there during the two following days in face of the fire of siege guns mounted on the bastions of the Ansand. On the 21st and 22nd, large numbers of Afghans quitted the city and passing eastward behind the Siasang Heights, took possession in great force of the forts and villages outside the eastern face of Sherpur. On the 22nd, a spy brought in the intelligence that Muhammad John and his brother chiefs had resolved to assault the cantonment early on the following morning, and the spy was able to communicate the plan of attack. The 2,000 men holding the King's Garden and the Mohammed Shuri Fort had been equipped with scalding letters and were to make a false attack which might become a real one against the western section of the southern front. The principal assault, however, was to be made against the eastern face of the Bimaru village, unquestionably the weakest part of the defensive position. The 23rd was the last day of the Muharram the great Mohammedan religious festival, when fanatism would be at its height, and further to stimulate that incentive to valor, the Mushki Alam would himself kindle the bacon fire on the Asmai height, which was to be the signal to the faithful to rush to the assault. The information proved perfectly accurate. All night long the shouts and chants of the Afghans filled the air. Purposeful silence reigned throughout the cantonment. In the darkness, the soldiers mustered and quietly fell into their places. The officers commanding sections of the defense made their dispositions. The reserve were silently standing to their arms. Every eye was toward the Asmai Heights, shrouded still in the gloom of the night. A long tongue of flame shot up into the air, blazed brilliantly for a few moments, and then waned. At the signal, a fierce fire opened from the broken ground before one of the gateways of the southern face, the flashes indicating that the marksmen were playing their rifles within 200 yards of the onset. The bullets sped harmlessly over the defender sheltered behind the parapet, and in the dusk of the dawn, reprisals were not attempted. But this outburst of powder burning against the southern face was a mere incident. What men listened and watched for was the development of the true assault on the eastern end of the great parallelogram. The section commanders there were General Hugh Guff, in charge of the eastern end of the Bimaru Heights, and Colonel Jenkins from the village down to the native hospital and beyond to the bastion at the southeastern corner. The troops engaged where the guides from the ridge down to Bimaru village and beyond to the native hospital, in which were 100 men of the 28th Punjab Infantry, and between the hospital and the corner bastion, the 67th 
reinforced by two companies of 92nd Highlanders from the reserve, which later sent to the defense of the Eastern Face additional contributions of men and guns. From beyond Bimaru and the Eastern trenches and walls, writes Mr. Hansman, came a roar of voice so loud and menacing that it seemed as if an army 50,000 strong was charging down on our thin line of men. Led by the Aghazis, the main body of Afghans hidden in the villages and orchards on the east side of Shepur had rushed out in one dense mob and were filling the air with their shouts of Allah heal Allah. The roar surged forward as their line advanced, but it was answered by such a roll of musketry that it was droned for the moment, and then merged into the general din, which told us that our men with Martinez and Snyders were holding their own against the attacking force. When the first attack thus graphically described was made, the morning was still so dark and misty that the outlook from the trenches was restricted, and the order to the troops was to hold their fire till the assailants should be distinctly visible. The detachment of the 28th opened fire somewhat prematurely, and presently the guides holding Bimaru and the trenches on the slopes followed the example, and sweeping with their fire the terrain in front of them, broke the force of the attack while its leaders were still several hundred yards away. Between the hospital and the corner bastion, the men of the 67th and 92nd awaited with impassive discipline the word of permission to begin firing. From out the mist at length emerged dense masses of men, some of whom were brandishing swords and knives, while others loaded and fired while hurrying forward. The order to fire was not given until leading Ghazis were within 80 yards and the mass of assailants not more distant than 200 yards. Heavily struck then by folly on folly, they recoiled, but soon gathered courage to come on again. And for several hours there was sharp fighting, repeated efforts being made to carry the low eastern wall. So resolute were the Afghans that more than once they reached the abatis, but each time were driven back with heavy loss. About 10 o'clock there was a lull and it seemed that the attacking force was earning their frustration of its attempts. But an hour later, there was a partial recrudence of the fighting and the assailants once more came on. The attack, however, was not pushed with much vigor and was soon beaten down. But the Afghans still maintained a threatening attitude and the fire from the defenses was ineffectual to dislodge them. The general resolved to take their possessions in flank and with this intent sent out into the open through the gorge in the Bimaru Heights, four field guns escorted by a cavalry regiment. Bending to the right, the guns came into action on the right flank of the Afghans, and the counterstroke had immediate effect. The enemy wavered and soon were in full retreat. The Kohistani contingent, some 5,000 strong, cut loose and marched away northward with obvious recognition that the game was up. The fugitives were scourged with artillery and rifle fire, and Massey led out the cavalry, swept the plain, and drove the lingering Afghans from the slopes of Siasang. The false attack on the southern face from the King's Garden and the Mohammed Sharif fort never made any head. Those positions were steadily shelled until late in the afternoon, when they were finally evacuated and by nightfall all the villages and enclosures between Sherpur and Kabul were entirely deserted. Some of those had been destroyed by sappers from the garrison during the afternoon, in the course of which operation two gallant engineer officers, Captain Dundas and Lieutenant Nugent, were unfortunately killed by the premature explosion of a mine. Mohammed John had been as good as his word. He had delivered his stroke against Sherpur, and that stroke had utterly failed. With its failure came promptly the collapse of the national rising. Before daybreak of the 24th, the formidable combination which had included all the fighting elements of northeastern Afghanistan, and under whose banners it was believed that more than 100,000 armed men had mustered 
was no more. Not only had it broken up, it had disappeared, neither in the city, nor in the adjacent villages, nor on the surrounding heights was a man to be seen. So hurried had been the Afghan dispersal that the dead lay unburied where they had fallen. His nine days on the defensive had cost General Robert singularly little in casualties. His losses were 18 killed and 68 wounded. The enemy's loss from first to last of the rising was reckoned to be not under 3,000. On the 24th, the cavalry rode far and fast in pursuit of the fugitives, but they overtook none. Such haste had the fleeing Afghans made. On the same day, Kabul and the Balahisar were reoccupied, and General Hills resumed his function as military governor of the city. Kabul had the aspect of having undergone a sack at the hands of the enemy. The bazaars were broken up and deserted, and the Hindu and Guzilbash quarters had been relentlessly wrecked. Sir Frederick Roberts lost no time in dispatching a column to the Kohistani to punish Mir Bacha by destroying their chief's forts and villages, and to ascertain whether the tribesmen of the district had dispersed to their homes. This was found to be the case, and the column returned after having been out five days. After making a few examples, the general issued a proclamation of amnesty, excluding therefrom only five of the principal leaders and fomenters of the recent rising, and stipulating that the tribesmen should send representatives to Sherpur to receive explanations regarding the disposition contemplated for the government of the country. This policy of conciliation bore good fruit, and a darbar was held on January 9, 1880, at which were present about 200 Serdars, chiefs, and headmen from the Kohistan, Logar, and the Gilzai country. Rewards were presented to those chiefs who had remained friendly. The general received the salams of the assembled Serdars and then addressed them in a firm but conciliatory speech. The country remained still in a disturbed state, but there was little likelihood of a second general rising. General Roberts was resolved, however, to be thoroughly prepared to cope with that contingency should it occur. Sherpur was encircled by a military road, and all cover and obstructions for the space of 1,000 yards outside the onsent were swept away. Another road was constructed from Bimaru village to the Siasang Heights, and yet another from the southeastern gateway direct to Balahisar, on both of which there were bridges across the Kabul River. Along the northern face of Kabul from De Afghan to the Balahisar, a road broad enough for guns was made, and another broad road cut through the lower Balahisar. Another military road was built through the Kabul Gorge to the main Ghazni and Bamiyan road in the Charde Valley. Strong forts were built on the Asmai and Sher Darwaza heights, and on the spur above the Balahisar, which, well garrisoned and supplied adequately with provisions, water, and ammunition, would enable Kabul as well as Sherpur to be held. The latter was greatly strengthened, the eastern point of the Bimaru Heights being covered into something like a regular fortress. Later in March, when the Kabul force had increased to the strength of about 11,500 men and 26 guns, the command was formed into two divisions, of which the first remained under the Lieutenant General, the second being commanded by Major General John Ross. The line of communications was in charge of Major General Bright and Brigadier General Hugh Gough was the cavalry commander in succession to Brigadier General Massey. On the 2nd of May, Sir Donald Stewart, arriving at Kabul from Kandahar, took over the chief command in northeastern Afghanistan from Sir Frederick Roberts. Sir Donald's march from Kandahar, which was an eventful one, is dealt with in the next chapter. End of section 6